Any philosophy, any ism, any view of the world has two sides to it. It can be a very positive thing or in the hands of the cynical it can be horrifically manipulated. Um, Christianity. Some people see in Christianity uh, the um, implication that we're all sinners, we're all to be pitied, we're all to be compassionate, we must go easy on each other. We're all in this together. There's only one way out and that's love. The only thing that makes uh, existence bearable is compassion and the nicer emotions. Other people say that, uh, well, Christianity is so fabulous that we have to protect it against anyone who menaces it, and that's why we have things like the Spanish Inquisition and the equivalent. Well, um, that goes for anything. In about the 6th century BC, or thereabouts, in India, um, Indian society had, by all accounts, become something of a dead end, or a rut at least, in that uh, India had formulated the idea of the transmigration of souls, um, uh, reincarnation, as a means of injecting morality into the universe. In other words, you are where you want to be, ultimately, at all times, and in all places, and in all circumstances. Everything that ever happens to you is a result of your deeds in past lives. So, if someone is uh, living in a horrible existence, it's really their own doing, and a, a few more lifetimes will correct that if they behave themselves in this life. And um, we here up at the top are the ones who are the goody-goodies, and we deserve to be where we are. <laughs> I think we can see how that philosophy can be abused by people who uh, believe in things like uh, old power structures or uh, oppression or... Um, uh, the concentration of wealth and goodness into, or at least material goodness, into a small amount of people to, uh, at the expense of everyone else. That's very... Reincarnation uh, with a moral edge to it is pretty useful to people who want to preach inequality and um, the inevitability of other people's suffering. Well... <clears throat> Around about the 6th century BC, as I say, along came two people. There were probably a whole bunch of them, but uh, two of us have uh, come down to us through history. One of them is the Buddha, my friend up there. The other one is Mahavira, who looks surprisingly like the Buddha, uh, but whose message was somewhat more austere and more demanding than the Buddha's. And these new people, um, again, there were probably more than these two, but these are the historical examples that are cited, said, no, um, reincarnation, there's a way out that is practically, in the grand scheme of things, instant. It's like the person, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation before, you're having a nightmare, but something in your mind says, you're asleep and you're having a nightmare, something in your mind says, I'm having a nightmare, or I don't like this dream, and through some strange effort of the will, you wake yourself up. You sort of, you don't understand quite how you're doing it, but you're through this enormous effort of the will, drawing yourself out of this nightmare into a, a wakeful state that is not as bad as the nightmare that you left. I think we've all done that. Well, these guys were saying, the Buddha and Mahavira and other, roughly saying, I suppose, um, uh, heretical people were saying that, no, no, you don't have to wait for eons to get out of this hellish cycle of uh, birth and death. You can get out like that. It's almost impossible to do it, but it can be done. What it generally uh, implied was you just simply stop dealing with the world. You withdraw from it in as much as it's possible to do so. Um, Mahavira says uh, you just sit down and ignore it. If that means death by starvation, so be it. You just refuse to accept reality. You say, enough just stop. The Buddha said, well, yeah, that's, I see what that, where he's going with that, but there's so many pratfalls there because it takes almost superhuman willpower to sit there and in a swarm of mosquitoes with tigers around and uh, an intolerable starvation in your belly to just ignore the outside world. I suppose maybe the Jains are onto something, Mahavira being the founder of the Jains. Um, Maybe they're onto something, but that is so impossible that uh, I think there's got to be some other way to do this. Now, 
there were that's that's often seen as a dichotomy the Jains versus the Buddhists but I see the real dichotomy as the Hindus versus both of them and some people have said that this book the Bhagavad Gita was uh, in, intended was written to come up with a reason why um, the old way of doing things might have some merit to it again it's it's uh, depending on how you look at it this might be this might be a uh, bit of anti-Buddhist propaganda or anti-Jain propaganda, or it might be a brilliant way to um, come to terms with a universe that doesn't make sense. The first chapter is called The Despondency of Arjuna, where Arjuna, who is our stereotypical everyman, looks at the world and sees nothing but hell and chaos and suffering and, and uh, pointless uh, dog-eat-dog endlessly destructive and self-destructive and cannibalistic universe and says I can't deal with this and he collapses in a state of utter despair I'll uh, quote his words here O day of darkness what evil spirit moved our minds when for the sake of an earthly kingdom we came to this field of battle ready to kill our own people Better for me, indeed, if the sons of Driharashtra, with arms in hand, found me unarmed, unresisting, and killed me in this struggle of war. Thus spoke Arjuna in the field of battle, and letting fall his bow and arrows, he sank down in his chariot, his soul overcome by despair and grief. Arjuna is in a battle that is insane, because it's the biggest uh, battle in history, the Battle of Kurukshetra, and he's facing his friends and relatives. To fight for a kingdom that he suddenly realizes the price is too high, he doesn't even want it anymore. That's the beginning of the book. That's uh, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, where, it's, where Krishna says, yes, I understand exactly what you're saying. I understand exactly why you are depressed by all of this. I understand why you assume that this is a horrible world, where dog-eat-dog dog is the rule. Um, but your reaction to it is not inevitable. Um, Arjuna in some interpretations of this, has decided that Mahavira and the Jains, or the Buddha, are right. Withdraw, forget it, it's just the world is too insane to even uh, try to come to terms with. And Krishna says, no, what you're, see what you're seeing is, in a sense, reality, but the spin that you're putting on it is not. This battle is just the way the world is. Crazy things are happening. When we see one animal preying upon another and uh, ripping it, it, the other one to pieces and eating it and feeding the chunks to its young or whatever, yes, that's, that's reality and there's no point in uh, hiding from that. But whatever spin you put on that, remember, is your spin. The, you're just putting your own um, pre-existing biases on that situation. Whatever happens to that animal is just the way of things. However you interpret that, is your choice. And through the entire Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna explains to Arjuna, there's a way to deal with this, and the way is to understand that the world is going to happen the way it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it, and it does say that it is possible to get out of this world by refusing to acknowledge it, but the pratfalls of that point of view are almost greater than staying attached to the world. It's really, really hard to follow this idea of uh, life denying, of uh, refusing to accept phenomenal reality and escaping from it. It's really hard. Uh, in fact, um, living in the world in many ways is easier than escaping from it. And here's how you do it. You withdraw into yourself internally. You continue to exist in this world, but you create in here a space where all is calm and all is imperturbable um, when it comes to potential interruptions from the outside world. Um, again, that philosophy can be abused because it's just a, a justification for the status quo, saying that the only way to get along with the universe is to accept it and cope with it, not try to change it. Um, but here we have two stark choices. The life deniers say, 
We must escape from it conclusively, even if drastic measures are necessary, especially in the case of the Jains. Or we have the other one, the one that is favored in this book. We learn to cope with the universe. That uh, discussion is going to divide people like uh, nothing has ever divided us. And um, it, uh, it's one of, the, one of the unresolvable questions, I think, of existence. What do we do about the fact that we are tossed into an insane world um, as helpless, as ignorant, and as blind as newborn kittens? We just don't understand any of this and now what do we do about it do we cope with it or we just go back where we came from the choice I suppose is ours again at the end of the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says having reflected fully do as do as thou will thank you